Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Got a Minute More, the fourth episode of Got a Minute More, in fact, where we uh, take a deeper dive into the movies that we've watched uh, over the past little while. And uh, today we're going to do something a little bit different. Kevin and I are going to take a look at some of the movies that have been coming out on Netflix of late, because Netflix has actually been surprising us with some interesting stuff, at the very least. Some of it very good, some of it not very good. We're going to take a look at some of the ones that we thought were really good over the last couple of months. Uh, Kevin, uh, why don't we start with uh, the new Coen Brothers movie, shockingly debuting on Netflix, called The Ballad of Buster Scruggs. Yeah, so um, I guess I guess we talked a little bit about this um, before I had actually seen it, and you were a fan of it. And basically, once I started actually watching it, I was messaging you throughout. Right. And immediately, my first impression once, because basically the structure of this is it's six shorts uh, that are loosely connected by... Yeah, a Western anthology film. Yeah. So the first one is incredible. And Tim Blake Nelson, as Buster Scruggs... Um, is sensational there's so much energy so when that ends i kind of i messaged you and i was like i think i just would have rather seen a full movie of buster scruggs than (laughs) gone on to whatever's coming after this because i don't know how anything can follow up tim blake nelson in that role yeah, I'm not sure that I don't know how you would have been able to extend that into like a 90 minute or two hour movie because the, the the energy was so manic and it was cartoonish as well, very kind of Looney Tunes physical humor and that sort of thing. Uh, he really reminded me of like a Bugs Bunny type of character, actually singing on horseback at the very start of it and then mm-hmm. coming in and just causing trouble in you know wherever you went, uh, not necessarily on purpose either because the actual character Buster Scruggs is nothing if not uh, a fair and even-handed man, if incredibly violent uh, when provoked. So, But, uh, yeah, I mean, Tim Blake Nelson, long been one of my favorite character actors, finally gets a chance in, like, a proper lead role. Uh, and, of course, the Coen brothers used him before in Oh, Brother, Where Art Thou? That's one of the movies that really kind of broke him as well. Uh, he just absolutely nails this. Yeah, and yeah, I did say the same thing uh, when I messaged that to you. I was like, I'm not sure if you could have extended this to a full feature. Maybe he just becomes too grating over that amount of time. Mm -hmm. But I mean, however long it was, 15 minutes or something, I just about that, yeah, yeah, I just wanted more. And I mean, I guess the big takeaway from the larger, the Ballad of Buster Scruggs, the full. Uh, anthology is it's pretty hit or miss for me there are a couple that are really good there's that one uh there's uh the fourth one i think is it the fourth one? uh fourth one is the one with zoe kazan that's the gal who got rattled okay. i think you're thinking you're probably thinking the third one because i think you and i talked about this it's called all gold canyon with uh tom waits Yes. As, as a prospector. Um, by the way, Tom Waits. No, that's... Again, another one of my favorite character that's the, actors. That's the fourth one, for sure. Because the second one is James oh, you're, Franco. No, you're right. You're right. I just can't count. I'm yeah. so sorry. Yeah, yes. you're right. James Franco and Nir Algodonis, that's the second one. He's a bank robber. Uh, Stephen Root is absolutely hilarious in that one. But again, it's kind of like, yeah, it's a little bit flat. Yeah. Um, apart from Pan Shot, which is one of the funniest things I've ever seen in a film. Yes. Um, Meal Ticket, which is Liam Neeson. And I can't remember who plays the actual entertaining guy with the, the, the limbless entertainer. That's uh, Harry Neeson Melling is his name. Harry Melling, okay. I honestly yeah. don't know that name, but he was really, really good. Uh, Liam Neeson, great as always. Um, but yeah, you're right. It's All Go Canyon is number four, and that's the Tom Waits one where he's a prospector, finds this incredibly serene, peaceful, beautiful valley, uh, and starts to tear it up for gold, and then all hell breaks loose. Yeah, that one's really good. Uh, the third one that we just briefly mentioned, the meal ticket one with Liam Neeson and Harry Melling, I thought was really powerful. Um, Super dark, too. Yeah. Um, two, the James Franco one, didn't really do much for me. And five felt way too long. And six didn't do much for me. Yeah, the, the fifth one was definitely, the, it was by far the longest of the bunch. I did like the story, but it, it felt like it use a little bit of a trim and yeah honestly the, the last one it's a group of passengers on um on a, on a stagecoach who are uh, apparently going to their deaths um it's sort of a metaphor for for death and crossing over into the other side and that sort of thing but uh, a little bit unclear as to what they were really trying to do with that to be honest with you i didn't really get the point of it so i don't know a little too literate for me i think is probably the problem 
I'm not a very smart man. Coen Brothers, though, dabbling back in the Western again. And those guys, man, do they have an eye for that kind of stuff. Uh, no Country for Old Men, uh, absolutely unbelievable movie. True Grit, another fantastic movie. Um, and this one, yeah, I mean, just the way that they shoot, uh, even without um, Roger uh, Deakins on this project, um, it's a phenomenal looking movie from start to finish. Like, I, I don't think that any of them looked at all bad. No, definitely not. And like you said, four is uh, the Tom Waits one is utterly, utterly brilliant to look at. Yeah, probably the best looking thing that I've seen this year out of all of the movies that I've seen. It's just staggering to look at. And that was one of the cool things I thought about this, too, is that each uh, little short, each little vignette, each little uh, each little piece had its own visual style, apart from having its own story, apart from having its own storytelling style. They each had their own unique visual style as well, but they all sort of meshed as well. None of them looked like they were out of place. Yeah, and as as well as that, uh, the Coen brothers, one thing they do incredibly well and always have since the start of their careers is their dialogue. It's almost... I mean, it's not similar in style, but it reminds me a lot of Tarantino where... It's so meticulously crafted. It's mm-hmm. so well written and so dense, and it gives actors so much to do. Like, yes, Tim Blake Nelson is really talented, but that character is written so brilliantly and oh, yeah. so charismatically that it, it just it just leaps off the page. And yeah. they've always had a knack for doing something like that. And again, at times here, it's just it's spectacular writing the dialogue and the interactions with characters are brilliant highly recommended that you guys watch that one it's uh it's been out for almost two months now came out at the start of november uh and you know even if you don't like all of them i honestly i think i probably enjoyed four of the six two of them though um the the titular ballad of buster scruggs and all gold canyon are absolutely phenomenal two of the best pieces of filmmaking that we've seen this year i think yeah uh, second on our list is a movie that came out in the middle of October. Uh, this is from, um, the Indonesian, uh, Mo brothers, Timo and Kimo, uh, their latest movie, uh, Netflix exclusive, the night comes for us. Another incredible violence and gore, uh, martial arts movie, uh, Joe Taslim as the, uh, the lead character and Iko UI, uh, doing a villain turn in this one, actually. Yeah. I thought this was, I, I mean, this isn't high art by any stretch of the imagination, but what it's <laughs> but what but what it's setting out to do, it does brilliantly. And yeah, it's got if you've seen the Raid Redemption or Rage Bar- or Raid Barandal, it's got a lot of crossover char- uh, actors from that. Eco Wise, Joe Taslim, uh, Julie Estelle is here as well. She was right. in uh, Barandal as the assassin who used uh, dual dual hammers as her weapon right um and yeah everyone everyone is a lot of fun to watch the action is really over the top perhaps even more so than raid uh than the raid movies and oh i think so yeah and And those movies set the bar pretty high yeah this is just a lot of fun it's super satisfying if this is something you're interested in yeah definitely i mean it certainly comes with a disclaimer that it's not for everyone because it is brutally violent and the story is the story is okay but it's pretty basic it's pretty bare bones uh and and there's not a lot to grab onto as far as character development is concerned and that but there are a lot of great characters who are a lot of fun a little one note um and well a lot one note and actually they're really really one-dimensional but um there there's just it's just so much fun to watch again if you're a fan of that kind of movie uh, another one that uh, came out in uh, the middle of November this time uh, that's that definitely needs a disclaimer on it uh, is a little uh, horror thriller. It's not really a horror movie. Let's call it a thriller uh, called Cam. It's about uh, uh, girls on the Internet and one particular girl on the Internet who uh, is what is called a cam girl. Cam girls are girls that do live sex shows on the Internet uh, for tips, for gifts, for, you know, just basic you know, payback from the men who are watching them. And uh, this particular girl runs into some trouble when she realizes that her profile has basically been stolen from her by a girl who looks identical to her, Kevin. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's kind of the, 
the in point for the movie is it's this girl who's obsessed with climbing the rankings on the website and making more and more money and building her profile. And then she wakes up one morning to find out her profile is online and it's her that is online. Like Mm -hmm. it's, it's, I guess, important to say it's not necessarily, it's basically her. And the question is what is happening because how, right? Yeah. And that's kind of where the thriller jumps off. Um, I thought I thought this was a lot of fun. I thought it was creative enough in uh, the way it told that story. At times, it can be a bit uh, over the top in the way it, and kind of cliche, I guess, is the word I'm looking for, where uh, there's an interaction with a pair of police officers that really bothered me. There's mm. some interactions with some of the men that are around her that are that also kind of bothered me mm-hmm. because because they just come off as a little bit cliche and they don't really add anything to the story especially the thing with the cops like I know I know the premise is to explain that the problem with cyber crimes like this or cyber stalking or whatever you want to call it is the police are still woefully ill equipped to deal with that but I don't know it just came across as pointlessly I want to say misogynistic but I I I don't want to go quite that far yeah I I don't know if it's misogyny as much as uh, like it's uh, the fact that the 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 cops were both men yeah I'm sure you could read that into it I think it's just a comment on society at large treating these girls as sex workers which in a way that they certainly are I mean they do things with their body for money Right. Yeah. Um, and, and it's I think it's trying to speak to the larger societal issue of judgment against uh, Cam girls. We have to note as well, Cam was written by a girl who was a, a sex worker, who was a, a Cam girl originally. Uh, girl's name is oh, it's escaping me. Issa. I'm going to butcher this. Issa Mazi. I don't know. Mazel. Maz, I, I, I would have, I would have gone with Mazai, but I, I Issa Mazai. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, in any case, it was written by a girl who was a cam girl. And by the way, it's a really, really good script for the most part, apart from those couple of little complaints. But yeah, I, I think it's, it is a comment on that industry as a whole and how society sees it and how society uh, sort of still shuns sex workers to this day. Yeah, I guess my complaint is if you wanted to make the movie uh, be a statement on the way society views any kind of sex work, that's totally fine. And that's a very valid thing because I agree that there's a gigantic problem with the way society sees any form of sex work whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Uh, But while you're folding that, while you're kind of making that a throwaway in a thriller, that's about something different. That's kind of more black mirror ish in a way. Right. I, I just think it's, I just think it's kind of like hollow lip service rather than actually exploring something that should be explored at some point. Yeah, for sure. Uh, by the way, the star of the movie is uh, Madeline Brewer, who actually has appeared in an episode of uh, of Black Mirror. I can't even remember which one it was, but um, she was also in The Handmaid's Tale. So she's got this whole like uh, future um, uh, apocalyptic sci-fi thrillery kind of thing down. Uh, so the episode of Black Mirror she appears in is the one where the troops are um, tricked into uh, fighting against uh, bugs or whatever. Right, 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 right. Which was okay. That was a decent episode. Yeah. I I, I don't see. I, I don't think I've seen an episode of that show we have, Mike. But we're, we're not going to talk about Black Mirror on this show, even though there was just a new episode out. Um, let, let's move ahead uh, to something that just came out a couple of weeks ago as we record this. December 14th is uh, the, the release date for Roma, uh, Alfonso Cuaron's new movie. And the first, is it his first since Gravity in 2015? I think so, yeah. That's crazy that he hasn't made a movie for what now three years. Uh, in any case, it did the the festival circuit Venice Telluride TIFF. Uh, it got a limited theatrical release in uh, late November because the only way for it to qualify for Oscars, I believe, is still for it to have. Well, not the only way, but it, it's still one of the requirements for Oscar qualification is that it has to be released in theaters at least for a limited run, at least for a week. I think it is uh, in the calendar year for which these awards are being given out. Um, and it is now, I would say a pretty solid, uh, front runner for the best picture Oscar. Yeah, it seems like it, it seems like it is. And in your review, you specifically mentioned some complaints with it. Uh, I have some as well. And mine, 
Mine are actually going to come across maybe even more harsh than yours. So I want to give a disclaimer Ooh. up front. So I want to give a disclaimer up front. This is a very this is a very good movie and I, I I understand that it's very very personal to Alfonso Cuarón and mm -hmm. I I'm absolutely ecstatic that he got a chance to tell this story in the exact way he wants to do it and really controlled the entire thing. Mm -hmm. uh, he directed, he wrote the script by himself. He's his own cinematographer on this movie. He's his own editor on this movie. So he really kind of controlled every aspect of this. I think my complaint is, and this is going to sound overly harsh, but I'm not really sure how else to word this. At times, this feels like a really pretentious artsy like film festival movie the kind mm -hmm. that the kind that you would joke about there is there is it's all shot in black and white and that alone is fine um but there's so much of the movie is dedicated to kind of these long sweeping camera shots that add nothing at all to the story whatsoever there's one there's one that i really kind of like lost my mind at when i was watching it and it was uh, fairly early in the movie, there's a scene on a rooftop where, I'm sorry, I can't remember the character's names off the top of Cleo. my head either. Cleo uh, is the maid, if that's who you're referring to. Yeah, Cleo and the youngest kid. Right. Uh, Which I uh, think is the Quaron um, yes. clone. I think yes. he's the youngest kid in the Antonio, family. I think his name is in the movie. That sounds about right. Something um, like that. So they are on the rooftop and uh, the youngest kid and his brother are playing with like toy guns and mm -hmm. um, the older brother gets mad and leaves and the youngest brother goes over to like this little table or whatever and lays down on it and pretends that he's playing dead and Cleo right. walks over, lays beside him and also plays dead and it's this really cute like really cute scene that shows the relationship she has with this family. But then we go from like a shot of them on this table or whatever laying there. There's like a 25 second pan just across laundry. And mm -hmm. I, it's like, like I don't need that. I don't. Yeah. It, was, it, it lands on the spot where she was doing the laundry before or something. Yeah. Like that. I guess, you I know? guess like I'm, I'm struggling. I guess the, the only thing I could assume is the point is like, look at the relationship she has with the kids, but she's still subservient to that family. Yeah. But the whole movie is about that. So like, I mean, yeah, it's established I don't, so much better elsewhere too, where yeah, the, the scene I don't where they're watching TV, shot. for example, they're watching a sitcom or something like that. And Cleo's in the room and she watches with them for a little bit. And then she's told to go and get something for the family. Right. Yeah. Like and clearly it, she's welcome and part of the family and then is still actually subservient as well. Yeah. And in that scene, and to, I think it's Antonio as well, when she's told to go get coffee for the dad, uh, and I think it's Antonio that pipes up and says, no, 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 she's with me or something like that. She still right. ends up ultimately going, but uh, like that is established elsewhere. And there are so many uh, camera moves similar to that. It's so it's so drawn out and it's so over overly artistic sounds like a really stupid thing to say, but I'm struggling to come up with a better wording for what my complaint is with the movie. I yeah. just like when it hits, cause there are emotion, there are emotional beats to the movie that r land with as much impact as anything you will see all year. It it's absolutely spectacular. But I thought the overall package was at times really boring. Yeah, I mean, I can't really argue with that, to be honest with you. Um, if I had more time, I probably would have mentioned something like that more than the 60 seconds I've you know, limited both of us to, which it's it's on me. It's all my fault, okay? Yeah. Um, but Yalitza Aparicio, who plays Cleo in the movie, wow, like what a find. Out of out of absolute nowhere, this uh, I think she's Mixteco is her background. She's so she's indigenous. Uh, she is from that region. That um, uh, the the background her her character's background background in the movie is from. Uh, probably playing herself more than anything, mm -hmm. but man, it, it never shows that she's a first timer on screen. Like she is so so good. Yeah, and uh, I mean, there's, there's, like I said, this is, this is a really good movie. Still, it's just at times it felt like it was overly, 
pretentious or dramatic or like really drawn out just for the sake of being artistic. Like there's a lot of camera movement where it's like, I understand it looks really good, but at the same time, I think you could just leave the camera stationary or do something more basic or do something more focused. And I know that's not Karan's style. He's basically famous <laughs> for doing yeah. the opposite of that. Yeah, but he's a in, showman. Yeah, but in most of his movies, it's never really felt um, obtrusive in the way that I felt like it was here. Forced, even. Right? Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, maybe the word is uh, self-indulgent. Um, like, like you say, it's such a personal project for him, and he clearly he wanted to make it his way and do everything you know the, the way that he saw it. Um, and maybe there was just no one there to tell him, no, this is you know, this needs to be trimmed or this needs to be changed slightly and that sort of thing. But again, I, I we're we're really dwelling on the negative here, and I honestly I have it in my top ten this year. Um, it is it is lower on the top 10 than I think a lot of people and other critics especially will have it, but it's still in the top 10. I, it's, I think, a fantastic movie with some problems. Yeah, I I do not have it in my top 10, but it would have been okay. it would have been like 11 or 12, essentially. And I think I do want to say as well, like if this if this were to win Best Picture, I'd actually be very excited for the concept of a foreign language movie making that breakthrough. Yeah, especially an independent film and now on a streaming service as well. You know, something that yeah. uh, Netflix was uh, not really known for. I mean, this is this is this is a really high concept movie. Uh, and that's let's face it, they haven't really done a lot of those. Maybe the exception is Mudbound last year. Um but man, there hasn't been a lot else uh, apart from this sort of recent spate of releases that have actually been surprisingly good. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's move on and talk about something that we've never talked about on our show before uh, a television series. Now it's a limited run series. Uh, I think anyway, uh, I don't know how they could do a second season of this. They'll probably try to find a way and ruin the whole thing. Uh, <laughs> the haunting of Hill house, which came out in the middle of October, the 12th of October, in fact. Uh, and this has been, I think maybe the most talked about, at least among our uh, co-workers in that uh, television series of the year. Yeah, this was this was extremely special. And if you don't know, Mike Flanagan um, is the creator of the show and directs every single episode of the show by himself. That's crazy. Ten there episodes, is, too, yeah. all hour longs. There is no other director associated with this. And Mike Flanagan is a film director predominantly. Um, he directed Oculus, which is a extremely overlooked and underrated horror movie from, mm -hmm. I want to say, five or six years ago now. Um, Hush, which you can probably find on Netflix, uh, is a home invasion movie where a deaf woman is being stalked in her own home. He did the Stephen King adaptation, Gerald's Game. And he did Ouija Origin of Evil, which I know sounds like a punchline, but <laughs> is actually a really, really good horror movie as well. So to be fair, got... The Haunting of Hill House kind of sounds like a punchline too. So yeah, uh, take it for what it is. Yeah, so I mean, he comes as one of the most exciting directors in horror right now, and this is kind of, I guess, his magnum opus. This is a utterly brilliant. Uh, horror TV show. Yeah, trying to think of of something that is even remotely comparable to it uh, in terms of the way that characters and storylines and backstories are fleshed out in a horror um, uh, piece of work. The only thing that comes to mind, and and please don't laugh, it's the video game Phantasmagoria. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you recall. I told you not to laugh. No, I'm just kidding. I can't um, help it. Do you recall that game? Do you remember that one? It was an old uh, Sierra adventure game, point no, and click adventure game. In any case, it, it, it's, it was bad, right? But it mm -hmm. was also so good. It was spread over, I think, seven CDs. So you can imagine what kind of massive game it was. It had that full motion video thing going on for it. It was in that uh, very short lived window where, you know, everyone was trying to do these full motion video point and click adventure games. In any case, you know, that, that where it has this really long through line of, of several things going on with all these different characters and how, how neatly it all wraps all of those things up in the end. Maybe a little too neatly, though, is, is kind of the gripe here. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so I I mean I didn't love the finale. I guess uh I I want to give I want to give a little bit of credit to the rest of the series up until then because basically everything leading up to the finale is spectacular and I don't think the problem with me criticizing the finale is I don't think the f- the finale definitely is not bad and no. the finale is the finale is just one way to wrap this story up. It's not what I wanted from the finale, and that's my criticism of it. And that's kind of unfair to 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 criticize a show because it didn't do what I wanted it to do. That's such a Star Wars thing to do, man. Yeah, exactly. It. I mean, it literally <laughs> is. It literally is the uh, the uh, Last Jedi. Yeah. The, it literally is that criticism, and it's just you, you are the uh, saltier than crate subreddit. I yeah, don't know if you've I'm, seen that at all. I'm Todd Edick. Um <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> so poor Todd. <laughs> so, in any event, uh, the the lead up to it is brilliant. The finale isn't what I wanted the finale to be. But it is. There's nothing inherently wrong with the finale. That's the that's the vision he had for how this wraps up, and it's executed brilliantly. I think we have to talk a little bit of spoiler territory too. For the first time uh, in, in this episode too, we're getting we're getting to spoiler territory here because the fifth and sixth episodes of this series are maybe two of the best back to back episodes of any television show I've seen. In ages, Kev, I think you agree with me on that. Yeah, I'm str- I'm really struggling as you were saying that to come up with a more a, a better uh, two episode sequence in any show like Breaking Bad, maybe with half measures, full measures, right? Like maybe, but man, maybe. like this is this is a brilliant two hours of TV. And I remember, so you had watched it before I had, and you'd finished the whole thing before I even started the series, in fact. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I, I remember that uh, experience of watching episode five, and you having told me that episode five was going to absolutely blow my mind. One of the characters in the show, uh, the youngest of the uh, of the Crane children, the Cranes are the ones who occupy this house for a summer in the 1980s, I think it is. Uh, they, uh, The youngest daughter, uh, Nell, uh, has been seeing visions of a woman with a broken neck and horrible dripping black hair, it looks like, and uh, uh, in like a nightgown uh, throughout her life, you know, since she was, what is she, like six or seven years old, six six years old maybe in the... In the, in the 1980s, maybe Probably even younger than that, there. to be honest yeah. with you, five or six years old, let's say. In any case, she's seen, she's seen these visions all throughout her life, and they start to creep back up as uh, the, the present day story unfolds, because it is told between two timelines, and it all culminates in this episode where she, again, massive, massive, massive spoilers if you haven't seen it, finds out that she is the Bent Neck Girl. Yeah, so yeah, that uh so it just kind of culminates so each episode of the series is basically a different member of the family's story and what they're being haunted by, what they're dealing with in their life after they've gotten out of uh Hill House. Mm-hmm. And episode 5 is Nell's episode and it kind of just slowly builds until we get to the point where Nell goes back to Hill House. And <clears> once <throat> once she gets there, there is a probably 15 minute sequence to end the episode mm-hmm. that I don't I don't think I took a breath for that 15 minutes. I mean, I know I did because I'd be dead otherwise, <laughs> but I it's just it's the tension is out of this world and the direction, the it, it, the storytelling, every single aspect of it, it is utterly brilliant and you think when that episode ends, there's absolutely no way Mike Flanagan can top what he did in that 15 minutes. And then he says, "Okay, uh how about a For the next episode, Two Storms, I'm going to do an entire episode where there are five edits and (laughs) it's going to take place in two separate time frames uh, in two different locations. 
Yeah, episode six, uh, absolutely another phenomenal, phenomenal episode where they're dealing with uh, uh, the loss of Nell. Um, this is something that actually comes up in the first episode. Uh, mm-hmm. And they're now having her funeral and all the all the, the family is gathering at uh, one of the other children's. It's at uh, Shirley. Shirley's the one who runs the funeral yeah. home, right? Yeah. Uh, they're gathering at her funeral home. And yeah, as you say, just these incredibly long takes. Um where all the performance is done in camera and even a lot of the effects and stuff are done in camera. They're very, very clearly being uh, incredibly well organized in their reveals of some of the scary stuff that's in there. And this is, this is the thing that I loved about this show. It is not straight up horror. It's Mm -hmm. actually a family drama in a horror setting. Yes. That works so well. And I don't think, again, I don't think I've ever seen anything like it. Well, I mean, I guess, like, to me personally, I think a lot of the best horror uh, is essentially a, in a similar vein of that. I mean, mm-hmm. in recent memory, I'm thinking of Hereditary and The Babadook as the two big examples, right? which are both very similar in that they're both essentially dramas that take place in a horror setting. And they do get scary. But they're also really dramatic and they really have something to say about whatever the topic is. The Babadook is obviously about like grief and it's about both of the two remaining uh, family members dealing with the loss of the father. Uh, Hereditary, same thing. There's a lot of themes about like grief and loss. And this is, again, a broadly similar interpretation of horror, which is we're going to deal with grief and loss and it's going to be uncomfortable and it's going to be difficult to watch on an emotional and dramatic level, as well as being scary. And it's the so if you if you didn't realize that you needed this, uh, you do. It's think think it's lost. Uh, with its, you know, shifting timelines and, and exploration of the individual characters back and forth between their their sort of two lives, the present day life and their life in Hill House, um, with uh, a satisfying ending, unlike Lost. Yeah. So, um, and I, <laughs> and I do also want to say uh, this is. Part of the reason I wanted to do this in this episode, even though we typically don't talk about TV, outside of the fact that I just think it's fucking brilliant and everyone Mm -hmm. should see it, is because uh, Mike Flanagan, the writer, director, and creator of this, is the writer and director of the upcoming Doctor Sleep, which is a gigantic film coming. It's the sequel to The Shining, essentially. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fact that... It is in hands this capable, this mature, gives me all the faith in the world that the Shining sequel is not going to be just a simple cash grab or cashing in on the name The Shining, but actually something that he is going he is going to take seriously. The cast is great, uh, the announced cast for that movie. This gives me so much hope that that movie is going to be as good as I want it to be. Yeah, I mean, that that cast, as you mentioned, Rebecca Ferguson, Jacob Tremblay from Room, Ewan McGregor, it's, it's yeah, Bruce Greenwood is in it. It's, it's a huge cast and um, really looking forward to it now, especially given that, um, you know, as you say, Mike Flanagan has done such an exceptional job. I don't think that I had ever seen anything of his beforehand, to be honest with you. I'm going to go back and watch some stuff now because, man, I was absolutely floored by The Haunting of Hill House. Uh, and you will be, too, if you watch it. Yeah, it, his entire filmography is very, very good. So I highly recommend going back and watching all of it. Definitely. Give it a look. All right. I think that about wraps it up for this particular episode. Uh, get on Netflix. They've actually got some good content right now. Uh, there's a lot of good stuff to watch. Some stuff that we didn't really have a chance to mention. Some middling stuff that was just kind of okay. Uh, Bird Box. It's kind of fun. It's kind of not. Um, Outlaw King, which is another movie that debuted at TIFF this year. Uh, Netflix has kind of gone balls out here. Um, probably shouldn't say balls out on the podcast, but whatever. Uh, it's my podcast and my balls are out. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I guess the big takeaway here is uh, that we've been mocking Netflix for a long time for being so uh, so bad at this. You know, oh, thinking yeah. back to Bright and Tau and the Cloverfield Paradox, and I can't so remember. great at TV and so bad at feature films. 
Yeah, and I can't remember what that other movie about like the end of the world with aliens was. Oh, was... yeah, yeah, yeah. I never watched that, but I remember you texting me about it and uh, saying it was basically one of the worst things you'd ever seen. Yeah, that uh, that was abysmal too. And now suddenly <laughs> they're uh, extinction. It's called. I just looked it up because right. Lizzie Kaplan was in it. Um, yeah, that's really bad. So the fact that they've really turned this around in a very short amount of time, like all of this stuff suddenly just kind of came out in the last little while. And mm-hmm. there's there's still more coming. I mean, obviously, we know Scorsese's next movie is a Netflix movie as well. Which is insane. I, I, I can't believe. I mean, this is this is the way things are going, right? Yeah. And that's... Um, Ultimately, that's fine by me. I do wish that they got uh, a little bit longer theatrical releases um, and a little less limited because mm-hmm. that's the that's been the method for, for Netflix. Similar to what Amazon Prime was doing with their original features as well, where it, they would put it in the theater for a couple of weeks. Some of the movies would get a wide release. I think um, they did it with they went wide with The Big Sick, but that was one of the few movies that they actually really went wide with. But uh, yeah, Netflix now starting to do that similar, give it a limited release thing, get it into theaters, make sure that it's at least eligible so they can get some some award buzz. Uh, And that's fine. I mean, so long as I can watch the movie in good high quality on my television, I'm pretty happy. And and I mean, really, it's the it's the quality of the movie that matters ultimately. Yeah, I mean, and it's as you well know, uh, my the condo I live in has a movie theater downstairs that I've been mm-hmm. making ample use of for things like that. So, yeah, by all means, I still get to see it on a on a fairly big screen. So, and we'll get to that in a in a future podcast as well. Kevin and I have some plans for that. Uh, but on the next one, on the next episode, we are going to talk about uh, 2018, the year that was. Kind of a mixed bag for movies. There was a lot of really, really good stuff that that came out of nowhere, I think, for, for some of them. Uh, and then a lot of stuff that really disappointed. But um, we're going to talk top ten and then maybe bottom five uh, on the next episode of Got A Minute More. Uh, thanks for watching us. Uh, make sure you check us out on gotaminutereviews.com. Follow us Facebook, Instagram got a minute reviews thank you again for listening have yourself a great new year and we'll talk to you soon